My name is Todd Beck, and I'm a Senior Product Manager for Education at ACAMS. Welcome to the ACAMS Web Seminar, An Innovative Game Changer to Fight Financial Crime, Cross-Institution Detection. Our first speaker today is Brendan Brothers, who co-founded Verifin, a BSA AML compliance, fraud, compliance and fraud detection software company, in 2003. Brendan is a computer engineer with background in analytics and an anti-financial crime subject matter expert with comprehensive technical expertise. He is a frequent speaker at industry conferences and principal presenter for Verifin's Framel Thought Leadership Webinar Series. Verifin, the sponsor of today's webinar, has more than 1,000 financial institution customers across North America. And I was telling Brendan earlier, not only does uh, the events that he sponsors and speaks at break records for attendance, but they also have the prettiest slides. So you're in for uh, both a visual treat and for something that uh, will help you in your job today. So Brendan, thank you very much for being here again. And uh, I will turn it over to you and let you introduce JR. Great. Thanks very much, Todd. Um, and I'm joined today uh, by J.R. Helmig, who's the founder and CEO of Leverage Outcomes. Um, and I'm excited to have J.R. here today um, as, as he's a financial intelligence subject matter expert and has got a, a lot of great information to share with us as part of today's presentation. Uh, just briefly, you know, certainly with 20 years experience, both countering illicit finance and in the client-facing financial sector, he's worked on offensive and defensive counter efforts in, across the intelligence community with DHS, Department of Defense, Treasury, and with many public partner, or excuse me, public-private partnerships. Also at FinCEN, former senior advisor to the Office of the Director, um, hired during the $100 million plus technology modernization that architected the advanced analytical vision and strategy across the data, analytical, and workforce domains. So if you've heard the director of FinCEN talk about that recently, that's one of the biggest things that they're proud of there at FinCEN. Uh, former principal at Lockheed Martin, designing commercial and government-facing FinCEN solutions, and has created and delivered innovative solutions for Fortune 20 companies. Um, so, obviously, uh, very happy and very pleased to have JR um, here with us and uh, be part of certainly my presentation here on the first half um, of today's webinar, but then also taking over in the second half. And as uh, Todd mentioned, uh, one of the things you'll notice as we go to, through today's presentation is um, we've tried to keep the, the slides as, as visually interesting as possible because sometimes when we talk about um, these instances of cyber fraud and so on, we can really get bogged down in a lot of the details and so on. But we want to keep today's presentation um, quite interesting as well. And we've got a lot of feedback on our previous ACAMS webinars that um, some of the things that, that we've been able to present on over the past several years have really been quite interesting and gotten great feedback. And I'm going to take some of that today as we walk through today's presentation and share with you um, a real-life fraud case and some of the challenges that we see from a suspicious activity detection perspective, really putting it through the lens of what our topic is today. That's an innovative game changer to fighting financial crime. We feel that cross-institution detection of suspicious activity is the way that the industry inevitably is going to go. And today's presentation as part one is really meant to kind of give you that landscape of where we think things are today, some of the challenges and some of the ways that cross-institutional detection um, can actually help financial institutions. And in Verifin's ACAMS presentation in the second half of this year, so we're going to do that in the fall, October 29th, I encourage you to, to join up for that when the invitations go out. We're going to speak to it a little bit more detail in the second half of the year as well and share a little bit more uh, from a practical perspective some of the different ways that institutions have combated financial crime. So look out for the invite for that and uh, certainly uh, be interested to have you join there as well. We're going to use chess as the background of today's uh, presentation. And, and chess is really, you know, it's very suitable when we talk about this idea of financial institutions fighting financial criminals. And if you look at the chessboard and you think about the pieces, you know, the white pieces, and you'll see this as we go through today's presentation, we have the white pieces which are representing the financial institutions. We've got the black pieces here which are representing the financial criminals. If you think about the game of chess, there's really more possible moves that can be made during a chess game than there are atoms in the universe. And parallel that over into the financial crime landscape, you know, the strategic moves that can be executed by today's financial criminals, they've grown to that parallel magnitude sophistication and organization. The ways that the fraudsters and the money launderers and the bad guys at the end of the day use the financial system to their advantage is really quite staggering. <clears throat> and what I thought would be a, a great starting point for today's presentation is to actually use a real-life fraud case and explain to you or, or show you an example of how a massive international fraud enterprise was able to accomplish this. 
And if you Google this after uh, we finish up today, you'll see lots of material about this, you know, the usage of thousands of false identities, fraudulent identification documents, doctor credit reports, and really at the end of the day, millions of dollars in fraud losses. This is a fairly well-known case um, that we've seen out there. And the key really is that it's, it was global in nature. The, the size of this was really quite substantial. It spanned at least eight countries um, across the world, including some of the largest, obviously, the United States and Canada and China, all involved in this. And specifically within the U.S., at least 28 states um, were part of this as well. And if you've been able to join Verifin in the past for some of our previous ACAMS webinars, last year I did a series of webinars that talked about the idea of criminal enterprises becoming much more organized. And the sophistication of these organized criminal enterprises taking advantage of the ability of cyber fraud and organization and the anonymity of the Internet and so on. Well, this example that I have today speaks to that same kind of idea because from an organization perspective, this distinct group had specific leaders. It had folks who worked under the leaders. And then it had accomplices who were out, for example, running complicit jewelry stores where millions of dollars in fraudulent credit card transactions were processed. And I think one of the, the linchpins in the entire organization was the one person who actually assisted in inflating the credit uh, through false identities through the manipulation of credit reports. And I'll share a little bit of uh, the detail on that in the next couple of slides as I talk about how this actually perpetrated itself. You know, so much so that when investigators actually look at the records of the two State Departments of Labor, uh, of, two, of two of them, I should say, it revealed that many of these co-conspirators who were involved had no reported legitimate employment in the last five years. And when you think about the types of activity you would see on somebody who's unemployed or underemployed, you generally think about small dollar transaction amounts. But if you look at the bank accounts and purchases that the uh, individuals involved in this had, wire transfers of half a million dollars, you know, million dollars flowing through one personal bank account, another one with $750,000 flowing through it, another one with $450,000 flowing through it, substantial amounts of money being moved through this criminal enterprise all under the radar, you know, with no element of detection as this was going on for several years. And if you looked at the affidavits that were filed as these people were being indicted and through the trials of some of these folks, and not everybody's been um, arrested and or convicted yet, a lot of the documentation describes the, the three simple steps <laughs> that they used in order to be able to perpetrate this. Make up, pump up, and run up. And what I want to do is just spend a little time talking about the actual fraud and how this occurred through each of these three different lenses. So let's talk about makeup first. And if I'm a criminal in this kind of makeup stage, what the defendants would do is they would make up a false identity by creating fraudulent ID documents, fraudulent credit profiles with the major credit bureaus. And in some instances, these identities were completely fraudulent, both from a social perspective as well as, you know, additional pieces of IDs and names and things. Sometimes they were synthetic where, I mean, they were taking names and tax IDs which matched, but then they were associating with other pieces of ID which may not have been uh, real, may have been reproduced. There was one case uh, where they actually used the Social Security number for uh, a six-year-old boy that had a completely different name. And then they did all the kinds of standard things like using utility bills to be able to increase the validity of an identity and all these kinds of things. So, you know, step one, base case, we need to go out and we need to get all these false identities created. Once they had the false identities, then they get to the pump-up stage. And in this stage of the fraud, what they actually did was they would pump up the credit of the false identity by providing false information about that identity's creditworthiness to the credit bureaus. And this is now where it starts to get a little bit more complicated and interesting because what we're seeing now is fairly standard rudimentary type things where, you know, the bad guys are going out and they're applying for credit cards with fairly low limits and they're making small purchases and paying them off to get that good history of credit. The only problem with that really is that it's slow and time consuming. So what they actually started to do was they, they got connected with this person who would help them create trade lines. And by trade lines, what I mean is a, a primary trade line, if you think about your credit report, a primary trade line, it's a line in your credit history. So, you know, you get a line of credit or you get a credit card or you get a mortgage or something like that. It creates a primary trade line in your credit history. And then there's a second type of trade line called an authorized user trade line. And basically that's if you're a joint on somebody's account. So what they actually did in this instance was they would find people with perfectly good credit on Craigslist and they would pay them to have these false identities added as authorized signers on credit cards and so on. And then you're almost taking advantage of the good credit of the primary holder and you're adding these bad guys in 
then to take advantage of that through these authorized user trade lines. And what they did was they actually got this person who had a business called the quote-unquote one-stop credit shop, and the owner posted these trade lines to the credit histories of the false IDs. She sold them, you know, I think it was $600 I read in, in one case where she saw, sold a primary trade line. And then because they were using the primaries as well as adding these fake IDs as secondaries, you know, as authorized signers on different accounts, it's basically almost like a Ponzi scheme. They're build, building up and building up and building up this credit worthiness on all these different identities so that at the end of the day, they can get to the run-up. And now I have the fake IDs, so I have these fake entities, you know, running around. I have them with perfectly good credit and really good credit scores. Now they're going to run up large loans using these false identities. And these loans, you know, never repaid, defendants reaping the profits. Um, they applied for numbers and numbers of credit cards. They managed them typically online, so there was no face-to-face -face interaction. They used uh, staggering numbers of drop locations. I think the stat I have coming up later is that there was 1,800 drop locations. So those are, you know, post office boxes and addresses, you know, homes and stuff that they've compromised and so on. They used sham companies where what they would do is they would actually go and, you know, get uh, credit card terminals. So they would go to several credit card processors and get these terminals, and then they would take these credit cards and run them through the sham companies, basically stealing money. And then that money would get distributed out to the co-conspirators, and they would do things like buy gold and other kinds of you know, easily, uh, easy things that they could turn into cash and hide their money and launder their money and so on, and run up these large, large loans, take advantage of this, and never, ever pay them back. And... Just to give you a sense of what this looked like, this is a chart. This is based just on a small sample. So there's 100 false identities in this. There was over 7,000 total um, that they know about, uh, but there was 100 false identities and 15 sham companies in this table I'll show you. And just have a look. You know, you can see that one of these defendants had about a dozen. One had 18, 17 false identities that were all linked to this defendant. If you follow the lines across, for example, you know, they're on the second line. You can see that this person had almost 500 uh, sample fraud cards um, or fraud cards in the sample, I should say. You know, losses, some of them getting up into the millions of dollars, losses on these cards, you know, connected to sometimes upwards of a dozen different sham companies that all these transactions were run through. And then the money that was received from the sample sham companies, again, hundreds and hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars and so on. And this is just taking 100 false IDs out of the 7,000 false ID bucket, just to give you a sense of the dollar amounts that were involved in this. It's really, really quite staggering what these folks are able to do. Think about it from, you know, the again, going back to the chess pieces and the moves on the board, some of the illegal moves in their game, there was one jeweler that was part of this, you know, one of these sham companies. 95% of the charges at one of their terminals were fraudulent and related to this enterprise. And that rang up to almost $400,000 in eight months. There was another jeweler where 92% of the charges on a terminal were fraudulent. And that was, again, you know, $344,000 in an eight-month span. And then the third one, 69% of the charges on two of the terminals fraudulent and related to the fraud enterprise, and, you know, over $300,000 again there in a six-month span. So the numbers just really, really quite staggering with this particular bust-out instance. You know, there was at least 18 organized fraudsters in this scenario, 1,800 drop addresses that they used to be able to create these identities. There was over 7,000 synthetic identities that were created during this uh, process. 25,000 fraudulent cars that were used, 80, at least 80 complicit businesses that we know about. And then the total, over $200 million in losses because of this one single group. So, you know, it's, it's really quite staggering the complexity that some of these organized criminal enterprises will actually go to to be able to steal money. And the question is, is how do you actually detect this stuff at the end of the day? You know, there's several disadvantages that, if you think about the individual bank, faces when trying to detect this type of fraud and money laundering. You know, you're only seeing a very small piece of it. You're not seeing the overall picture. You know, I just, in retrospect, it's very easy for me to paint this picture because we have all this material and, the, you know, the FBI and the other law enforcement agencies have done all their research and, you know, uncovered all these rocks and looked at all these things to find it. But if you're a single institution, how do you possibly do this? You know, there's a number of different challenges to trying to do this as a single institution. And within our customer base, you know, we have a user community, over 6,000 folks, um, in our community. And when we t chat with our customers through our conferences and our user groups and even, you know, looking at some of the material that's out there, there's six common challenges that we sometimes see um, as part of this. And I want to go through each of these and then what I'll do is I'll describe how the idea of cross-institutional analytics might actually be able to help solve some of these challenges in the weeks, months, and years ahead as we start to explore this concept and idea. 
You know, take card fraud, for example. You know, if you have a compromised ATM or a point of sale terminal, or if you've got a merchant or a payment processor breach, you know, I think there was one of these last year, you know, where, you know, millions and millions of cards were compromised. I mean, how do you do that as a single institution? You know, from a detection perspective, a single financial institution needs to have some critical number of cases. You know, they have to be able to see that these all are originating from the same source. They have to be able to triangulate them back to that source. But if I'm a small financial institution and I don't have that critical number of cases, it's very, very difficult for me to be able to triangulate all that back and find that instance of card fraud. So, you know, picking up things individually is, is you know, very difficult, but individually it's almost impossible. Criminals disguising themselves as legitimate businesses or occupations. We saw this in the case that we just talked about just then, you know, where we've got jewelers which are being complicit and so on. The detection challenge of a single financial institution there is that, you know, small pools of occupations or business types makes peer profiling difficult. I have a jeweler which looks like all these point-of-sale transactions are going through, but is that really a normal amount of transaction activity for that customer? If I don't have other jewelers to be able to compare it to, it's very difficult for me to be able to do that. Criminals who repeat their crimes by moving to other institutions, you know, one of the challenges here is that you, you have to have these known fraudsters on your internal watch list. You have to be able to, to see that. And if you don't, you don't know about it until they become a victim. And I think, JR, when we were preparing for this presentation, this is one of the things that you thought was a, was a big challenge for single institutions as well. Sure it is, and uh, hello to the ACAMS community, and thank you for having me here today. Uh, as Brennan pointed out, this is a challenge not only for financial institutions, but also the good guy organizations, the law enforcement, the investigators, and so forth, because they struggle to maintain what's known as a best of breed or a reasonable standard and to maintain currency in the way that you optimize these kinds of different watch lists against each other. So, you know, law enforcement is inundated with so many cases, it's often difficult to efficiently and effectively query systems for anything but simple name checks. And the classic example I offer is that if you look at what was on uh, the FBI's top 10 most wanted list, there was a Boston gangster named Whitey Bugler several years ago. And based solely on just what was provided on that FBI website, one would have to create a complex query with over 160 unique conditions in order to accurately state that he was not in the database being searched. So it presents two problems. One is many people don't have a robust enough watch list to understand all the bad guys in their ecosystem. But then second, the, the second problem is, is now I'm inundated with all these uh, watch lists. I can't effectively search my uh, database to see if I have any hits and at least not maintain the currency uh, technological advances and so forth. Right, and, and PEP list screening is a proper example of that too, right? Even you take that idea of being able to try to identify somebody who's on a PEP list and they move from institution to institution or they open up accounts and the question is, do I actually have that PEP based on the information I have? It's, it's a big challenge for smaller institutions or single institutions even. Fraud rings, you know, as in the example that I just showed, <clears throat> you know, in the bust out kind of scenario that we just have there, a lot of times financial institutions, when they look at it individually, don't even see it as a fraud. A lot of times it gets labeled as a charge off or a bad credit, and it may be months or years or maybe even never that you know that that thing that you wrote off was actually part of this fraud instance. Um, and that was a big challenge in the instance that we just saw. You know, many institutions just simply didn't realize the fraud was being perpetrated. They just saw it as a charge-off uh, because of a, an unpaid loan. From a new fraud scenario's perspective, um, this is another big challenge when you look at things in a single institution because oftentimes it's very difficult for a bank's detection system to see patterns if you only see periodic cases. You know, a lot of times these rules need to have training cases and be able to go back and, and look over longer periods of time. Sometimes it's very difficult if you only have a very small sample set. And I think you, you've thought of that as well, right, Jair? Right. And the real challenge here, and, and I've been involved uh, knee-deep in analytical efforts across some, some really pressing either national security or multi-organization or multi-geographic jurisdiction of fraud cases, and what you, try, what you end up having to do is build patterns, but you only have one or two training points per one million of clean or normal transactions. And so when you build a pattern off of it often results in too many false positives to be used operationally. So the idea is by increasing your pool of training points or known bad actor events, uh, you can uh, increase the accuracy of your automated screening uh, tools.
Right. And then the sixth one that we hear a lot of is this idea of microstructuring. And you can think about it through two different lenses. You know, microstructuring, everybody knows the challenge. You know, if you have people coming in and depositing $500 in cash, it's nearly impossible to pick that up from a money laundering perspective because it's such a small dollar amount. But think about it from a microcrime perspective as well, you know, thinking back to card skimmers and those kinds of things. If you have instances where, you know, it's a $100 point of sale purchase, how can you possibly know that that's a fraudulent transaction relative to something else? When we see these kinds of microcrimes, it's very difficult within a single financial institution to detect this kind of stuff. Top all of that together now with probably the biggest challenge of what we see today, the ominous opponent is this dark horse of cyber fraud. Um, you know, it's it's much easier now for these organized criminal enterprises to take advantage of things because they can do a lot of it over the Internet. They can do a lot of it that's not face-to-face. And there's an interesting report that just came out recently from Verizon. Um, their 2014 data breach investigation report, which you can see there with the link, you know, they talked about the primary cyber fraud threats that they had seen over the last 10 years. And 92% of those could all be traced back to nine kind of groups. And you see some of those slightly there on your screen, you know, payment card skimmers, which is a huge problem, point of sale intrusions. Um, I don't know if you've seen the recent news story that the U.S. may have uh, post offices now with automated stamp dispensers that might have skimming devices in them, you know, web app attacks, which include online banking systems, all of these kinds of things. When you think about the challenge of online banking fraud, timing is imperative. You know, financial institutions have to innovate to stay ahead of these financial criminals. And, of course, the question then is how? These bad guys are out there, and you know, moving much, much faster than most of the financial institutions. Cross-institution detection, um, I feel, allows you to leverage these kinds of things, the power of many. And when we think about this, there's a great quote from Edmund Burke, you know, when bad men combine, the good must associate, else they fall one by one. And this idea of, of falling one by one is something that has kind of led us to the idea that the cross-institutional analysis approach is, is necessary. When you think about financial institutions operating independently, they really don't get the complete picture of the fraud instance. Take the example that we just showed off the top. You know, there's dozens of financial institutions that were all involved in that, either as the credit card issuers or as holding the accounts for the sham companies and so on, and nobody could get the true picture of everything that was going on. But when everything comes together, and you'll notice now we've moved to red chess pieces showing this idea of the cross-institution perspective, Individual financial institutions can reap these benefits of cross-institutional analysis by sharing information. And as I said, it, it allows us then to leverage this classic power of many. Um, because, you know, as has been attributed to Helen Keller alone, we can do so little, but together we can do so much. And this is not just something that we've seen, um, you know, within institutions talking about themselves. The authorities are also coming out of information sharing here as well. You know, uh, I've got a slide on... Um, FinCEN and the OCC coming up, but just take the other two logos there, the, the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S., Department of Justice. Just recently, I think it was uh, back in April or May of 2014, they put out a statement on the sharing of uh, cybersecurity information and talked about how an analytical framework for information sharing, they don't believe that antitrust is or should be a roadblock to information sharing. And they've talked about many different forms of information sharing, whether it's structured or unstructured, you know, human to human, automated, somewhere in between. The FDIC, in one of their statements, uh, you know, recently talked about uh, institutions checking with their service providers about the existence of user groups that could be used as valuable sources of information. Even FinCEN, you know, the 314B provision has been around for years and years. And it's interesting to note that even just recently, I think it was October last year, FinCEN put out a fact sheet on 314B, and nothing had changed about 314B in itself, but the idea that they want to make institutions aware that, yes, you can share information, you know, what does 314B allow us to do, what are the benefits of it, who can take advantage, and so on. It's more information coming out from these regulatory bodies and agencies saying that we should start to think about information sharing. And Thomas J. Curry, he met, uh, it was at a meeting of the CES government in Washington in April 2014, he's controller of the currency, talked about effective information sharing in the industry will help to increase awareness within individual institutions and across the industry. It will enable the sharing of best practices, techniques, and strategies, collective responses to wide-scale events, and it'll also help banks focus resources on the most significant areas of concern. So we have FinCEN, we have FDIC, we have the OCC, all talking about this idea of leveraging the power of the many through these various different channels. So let's think about what's possible 
if we revisit these six challenges we talked about earlier and we think about how anonymized big data and all these different kinds of strategies for cross-institution detection um, can actually provide institutions with these game-changing advantages because what we can do is we can actually look at these six approaches and think about how it might work from a suspicious activity detection perspective across multiple institutions. You know, take the card fraud um, example. If you think about card fraud across institutions, what it actually allows you to do is get a more complete picture of what's happening at merchants and terminals. And you can actually leverage suspected and confirmed fraud at individual institutions to raise the confidence a merchant has been breached or a terminal has been compromised. Think about it from this perspective. What actually can happen is these results of centralized analysis looking across different institutions can be propagated out to individual financial institutions who can handle these things differently, you know, whether it's blocking cards or you know, raising risk on cards or blocking transactions at certain um, locations. The idea being is that I as a financial institution may not have even seen fraud in any of my cards yet but because other institutions in my network have seen fraud and we're looking at it across institution, I can take advantage of that pool of wider information. I don't have to see it all within the walls of my institution. The cross-institution advantage gives me that ability to see outside of my walls and be able to protect myself against fraud. One of the second ones we talked about was this idea of you know, criminals disguising themselves as legitimate businesses or occupations. You know, take that jewelry store example that we talked about earlier. Well, you know, from a cross-institutional perspective, that's the advantage really of having lots of data. You know, gas stations as an example. Not only more gas stations to get a better sense of what's normal for that peer group, but you can actually lock in variables more closely. You may be an institution which has gas stations at interstates, but also in rural areas. How can I possibly know what's normal for those if I'm only looking at my own subset of data? Across institutions, I might be able to look at a larger, larger pool of gas stations on inter interstates and be able to come up with a better sense of what's normal or what's okay for them. Criminals moving from one financial institution to another. You know, we've seen instances out there now where we can start to flag IP addresses that were involved in account takeovers as blacklisted locations. You know, for example, somebody logging in from that location as a high-risk event, and then that allows us to flag those kinds of locations. This is something that now becomes available by looking across institutions. Again, similar to the card fraud area, I don't have to be worried about me being the first victim of it. If I've seen victims in my network, then everybody can take advantage of that. You know, from a, a muling perspective, being able to flag accounts that have received fraudulent funds and being able to look across that way, you know, shared databases of check deposits, all these kinds of things can allow us then to be able to see this across institutions. Organized fraud rings was another scenario that we talked about in the beginning. And generally, you know, as we've seen in this case off the top of our presentation, criminals are generally spreading their activity across many financial institutions. And the challenge if you're one financial institution is that the footprint of this whole criminal activity actually may be very small. So you need to capture a fair bit of that footprint to put together what's happening. The more sophisticated the enterprise, the more they're going to try to hide their underlying operation. So when we look at this, through the lens of multiple institutions, we get a better sense of what's actually going on. You know, as they intentionally layer their list of funds to launder them, we start to think about looking things through a link analysis perspective and seeing where money is going to and coming from. We can start to think about using tools like social network analysis and these kinds of tools to track these flow of funds. And from an organized fraud ring perspective, there's many, many ways that criminals can be linked, you know, whether it's linking people to individuals or to businesses, you know, doing householding on phone numbers or on addresses or so on. All of this allows you to do this across institution. New fraud scenarios, you know, JR mentioned off the top the idea that it's very difficult sometimes to be able to get the training cases for these kinds of things. Criminals are going after easy money and sources and they're often committing these card frauds and check frauds across many different institutions. A single financial institution is really gonna only notice the trends, especially for these emerging ones when they see multiple cases. So it's very, very difficult to pick up on this. By the time they see it, oftentimes it's exploded and it might have hit thousands of financial institutions across the country. By looking at the power of the many, that instance of having to have all of those true cases to be able to build rules or to be able to notice normal activity or so on, again, I'm getting that power of the many because I'm seeing across the different institutions. And then finally, this idea of microstructuring and microcrimes, you know, criminals deliberately taking advantage of these siloed financial institutions by doing these small transactions. They're perpetrating them in a way such that an individual financial institution is never going to see anything suspicious at all. I mentioned the credit card 
fraud, when you know very small transactions on large volumes of cards, it's nearly impossible to see this as a single financial institution. But once you start to look at it across institutions, you can start to see things, for example, like 10 accounts being funneled. You know, in the last 10 days, cash was deposited at 100 financial institutions, commingled, and all came back to the same accounts that had several beneficiaries. When you start thinking about the possibilities of looking across institutions, and I'm not even just speaking about the idea of, you know, sharing simple small bits of data where it's an IP address of a, of a bad location or a terminal ID of a, of a skimmed terminal. I'm thinking, you know, two, three steps out ahead of that. What if we start analyzing data together across institution? What if we start looking at this from an anonymous perspective and try to be able to identify trends and behaviors and these kinds of things? That's really now when financial institutions can try to get back on par and get that leg back up with the bad guys. And, you know, if you think about this ominous threat of cyber fraud, you know, this is a stat out of the, the Verizon incident report. You know, a large, large portion of these web app attacks, a large portion of these point-of-sale intrusions, this is only growing. I mean, we're, we're never going to see the end of this until institutions start working together. And looking at entity link analysis, it's a powerful, powerful adversary to fight these organized fraud rings. To put a book in, and I thought of what I'd do is, is I'd pull another quote um, just to kind of give it all um, a sense of completeness. And Charles Darwin, he said, you know, in the long history of humankind, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have been prevailed, have prevailed. And this is, is really to the root of what we're talking about here today. When it comes to these organized financial crime enterprises, when it comes to these sophisticated types of fraud and money laundering, a single institution is at a decided disadvantage to the fraudsters who are working across multiple institutions. And as we start to move towards this idea of cross-institutional analysis and see the industry take a stronger look at this, I think this idea of collaborating, improvising, and being more effective will allow financial institutions to prevail against these threats of, of fraud and, and money laundering. As I said, this is the first presentation of a, of a pair. We're going to do one later on in the year as our second ACAMS webinar. Um, but in the meantime, I certainly would encourage you to reach out and, and look at our Educational Resource Center as we continue to build out more material on this um, in the coming weeks and months. Go to Verifin.com, and in the top right corner, there's a Resource Center section, and you'll see a lot of the material that we're going to be putting together um, on this. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, JR, and uh, JR is going to share with us a, an insider's perspective on this idea of suspicious activity detection and the idea of actually looking across things uh, across institutions to be able to take a better approach to that. JR, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Brendan. Um, to, to set the stage, you know, we've been talking about using chess as the example. Uh, and it really is, if you think about the rules of chess, there, there's a very structured way to play chess, and there's boundaries, and there's pieces that uh, each one of the uh, uh, pieces can use. There's a certain way they can move. There's a certain boundary around them. From my perspective, if I'm a bad guy, I have no limitation. So if the goal of chess is to take your opponent's king, why go through a bunch of moves? Why not just walk over to the board, grab the king, and move it wherever you want to on the board, or just take it and end the game? And that's a very simplistic view, but I think it sets the stage for how people often look at this. The good guys often put these boundaries around themselves that the bad guys don't have. They're not constrained by ethical or morality or other considerations. And sometimes when we're conduct conducting our analytical functions, we need to think uh, more like bad guys, if you will. So for today's agenda, we're going to cover a couple of points. And, and because there is such a diverse, you know, ACAM said there were people in over 100 countries here today. So we have to first establish a common understanding to make sure that we're talking about the same thing. We're going to talk about some challenges and then some common elements with some real-world examples. The idea here is for those people that say, yes, I would like to get better on my analytical functions and uh, be more accurate in those uh, type of capabilities, is how do they crawl, walk, run so that they can evolve to, uh, to uh, cross-institutional analysis and detection. So this first chart is, is a standard uh, customer identification program, a KYC. Nothing really earth-shattering here, but basically you have an account that is opened. It goes through some sort of automated screening process, maybe some internal, some external rules and data points. And then it goes through a pretty common decision cycle. Either somebody is green-lighted, they're okay, they're red-lighted, and maybe somebody needs to file a SAR and STR against them. Uh, or they have some sort of uh, additional review that is needed uh, for a publicly exposed person site. And there's some key challenges slash opportunities there. And, and one of them I alluded to earlier 
is that the watch lists are ever-changing. Not only that, but the technological and software capabilities to enable you to check your names against a watch list are also improving. So as the regulators come into your shop to do their investigations and their exams, how are you demonstrating that you are always maintaining a state-of-the-art capability and there's reasonable standards that, uh, that have to be uh, dealt with there? So next we look at a sample transaction monitoring process. And again, this is very simp simple uh, overview. There's some sort of transaction request or benefit, some sort of automated screening that occurs using maybe some internal rules or some external third-party data vendors. And again, you have your red, yellow, green. And there are several different types of fraud rules, but you know, I just want to make sure that we're working from a common definition that you know, there may be something that's uh, geographic related. You know, the person is on board an airplane at 30,000 feet. How is their credit card being used at, uh, you know, a country 16,000 miles away? Maybe the product is something that uh, they typically don't buy. Or maybe there's something, uh, as, as Brendan alluded to, maybe the vendor has some suspicious activity in their history. And basically, you try to center those out. But in regards to this, there's also uh, some very distinct problem sets. And, and I have surveyed and, and operated hands-on on many, many monitoring processes, uh, KYC or transaction monitoring processes across the world. And it's very interesting to see how, even after we've been doing this for so long, we still struggle with cost effectiveness. Uh, or if we do have a process in place, it's not easily scaled uh, when a new organization is added to the mix or a new watch list is added to the mix. There's often a very, uh, you know, you can see several examples there, but let's touch base on accuracy. You know, is a name only search, is a name only match good enough inside a KYC, or is in a gross three standard deviations uh, from the mean uh, uh, anomaly enough for a transaction to be highlighted? So, you know, accuracy is a very, very squishy uh, problem in this domain. And then also, how do you measure performance? And how is it optimized? And I know, Brendan, you were mentioning that you, you face this challenge all the time with your current client side. Well, one of the things, yes, that, that, that we see a lot is that sometimes these two processes aren't even connected together, you know, where you have the account opening process where you're gathering this information during your CIP program, but sometimes it doesn't even affect the transaction monitoring process. And again, so it goes back to what you're talking about, about it being efficient and being accurate. Sometimes, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So... Um, there, there's certainly some challenges in some of even the, the traditional approaches to this. And if you watch what's happening inside some of the regulatory notices that are coming out, OCC, for example, they're asking for organizations to audit their capabilities. And you better make sure that the people doing what's known as independent validation and verification, IV and V, are not the same people that are out there actually conducting your processes. You have to have that separate two-person check, if you will, uh, in, in order to maintain independence. Uh, so next, let's look at some uh, common analytical uh, capabilities. And, you know, it, it, as many people know, uh, there's many different ways to do this. We've talked about, you know, the onboarding process. Maybe there's some key elements there. Um, but the one thing about entity resolution that often is missed, there's an additional part that belongs here, and that's entity verification. So the entity resolution is I'm looking at two houses of data. One uh, says John Doe maybe lives in California in the United States. And the other one says that John Doe maybe lives in Florida in the United States. And the question is, are they the same person? Maybe you know, he moved from California to Florida or vice versa. But then there's also the entity verification. And that is now as a financial institution, I am being asked to approve a transaction, to onboard a new customer, and is the person who is requesting that transaction really the same John Doe as I have the information against? And we see that all the time with uh, ZooSpot and other identity account takeovers and some of the cyber theft, or identity theft and cyber fraud. So when we look at the transaction screening, a key point here is that many uh, monitoring or screening processes are one-dimensional. And many organizations have difficulty when going to a multi-dimensional capability. So, for example, you may have an investigative organization that has a domain ex expertise in a very narrow view, but as Brendan alluded to, they have difficulty replicating this at scale. Maybe they can't do it in the optimum price point or time period necessary, or they're not, you know, the right hand isn't talking to the left hand. And when we look at period periodic review, this is key because, again, these are typically done in a silo. 
And while that is good perhaps from an audit perspective, it also means that those conducting the review are not very familiar with all of the documents available at the time of onboarding. And especially as a client stays in the same financial institution for a longer period of time, it's more and more difficult for the investigators or the analyst to go all the way back to the point of origin and actually touch and look at the original documents or the original data. And we're going to talk about some challenges on that why, as to why that is. But many people inside the fraud space say, I don't want to see the database view. I want to see the actual data as the, as the uh, client or customer send it in for, for review because the bad guys are trying to hide stuff in there. So overall, it's a very challenging process. And, and we've mentioned a couple of times today about different stove stovepipes. And so I just want to do is, is highlight the different tasks. Uh, typically what happens is you have some sort of mandate or tasking from a higher up. And, you know, this is uh, uh, looking down at the top level ecosystem of the, of the view, if you will. But there's a tasking that's identified. And then hopefully, before anybody runs to a database to run a query or before anybody starts an analytical project, um, they talk about the data that they're going to use. And they're asking themselves, is the data I'm about to use really the best data for me to try and address this kind of problem or opportunity? And then you have to fuse the data, you have to store it, you have to protect it, and then you have to feed it into some analytical or investigative production needs. And then finally, you need to, you know, there's some work product that is generated, and then it's disseminated to uh, the, the customers of the data set. And by remembering, though, that these are distinct activities, one can more easily understand the challenges as we're discussing them today. Well, right, and JR, just to build on that as well, that you're talking about the data sources and things like that. One of the ideas then becomes is, you know, is the data source within my institution or is it a cross-institutional data source? And sometimes the challenges that come along both with internal and external data is making sure that it all replicates and, and works together. You know, we've seen a lot of challenges in some institutions that we work with where, you know, one employee will represent data or a transaction in, in one certain way and another employee will represent it a completely different way. And then how does that work together when we start thinking about putting multiple institutions together? This idea of having properly collected data, processing it, and storing it in a way that's useful um, is a challenging process, and it is one of the things that institutions need to take heed of if they start to go down this, down this road of, of looking at how can we do this analysis across institutions. Well, and, and even how can they do it internally? So I, I agree with everything you're saying. And, and, you know, somebody inside the fraud unit inside the mortgage division of a bank versus somebody inside the fraud unit of a securities division in a bank are going to query the same database for the same person two different ways. And so we run into all sorts of problems, not only how is the data stored, but how are the business processes standardized, not to curb somebody's intellectual or analytical curiosity, uh, not to curb their capability, but to at least check the box on some basic foundational uh, building blocks before they, before they get too unique in their process. Definitely. So we're looking here at a couple of technology challenges, though, right? We're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to get to this desired end state, and there's really a couple of disparate perspectives. And so let's look at a couple of them. Uh, first of all, it's the back-end systems. And you know, I lived through this at FinCEN. I lived through this through other uh, organizations where if you were to ask all the people that have to manage the collection of data or process and, and then protect it and then disseminate it to consumers, and in this case, we're talking analytical consumers, not banking consumers. But if you look at this back-end systems, you would design a database that might look like uh, you know, X. But then there's this other community called the front end user community. And that front end user community has a very distinct set of needs, and sometimes they change quite rapidly. Maybe they want to be able to do some pretty unique analytical functions. And at the end of the day, they have to create some sort of actionable product, meaning somebody is getting onboarded into my system, maybe there's an alert that's fired that you know, this particular transaction may be fraudulent, and they have to create a decision at the end. And the ideal makeup of the database and the process and the, the, the environment, that ecosystem from a front-end user perspective is very, very different than that of those that are trying to optimize the back-end systems. So we have a quandary. So there are some hidden challenges that often come into this, for example. And along this way, you have to address, as Brendan alluded to a minute ago, the data quality and the integrity. So how one organization might view a missing or a null field is going to be very different than how another organization might uh, 
collect in a missing or null field. I see this all the time on social security numbers. Some banks, if you don't have a social security number, they'll put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Others will put unknown, but they'll spell the name unknown 15 different ways. And so those are just some of the challenges we run into. Data protection. Now, this is, this is key because we do always need to be cognizant of the proper use of data as well as how to protect it, both internally and externally. Uh, there are several cases in the news over the past couple of years about people uh, walking out of Swiss banks where they were systems administrators or they were database administrators, and they walk into the German or the uh, UK tax office, and they are willing to hand over a listing of accounts and, and people's names and, and their home addresses uh, for a million or five million dollars. And so, you know, you have to protect not only the external cyber attack, but also the internal uh, event as well. And Oftentimes, the banks have not yet reconciled that data sharing, privacy, and access controls really have to account for all the geographic areas in which they operate. So if you are an EU-based bank and you are doing business in the U.S. and you're handling a transaction on a South American customer and you offshore to India your fraud checks, uh, you now have to make sure that your privacy and your data accuracy and some of these other things are built in for all those legal jurisdictions. So, you know, we've all heard that do more with less. We all know the difficulty of having a modernized technology while still maintaining operations. We've talked a little bit about the proper use and access controls. But here's one that a lot of people forget about. Um, imagine being an analyst and you have, say, a thousand uh, transactions or accounts to review over the month, uh, month time. Uh, the way you look at the last one is going to be very different than the way you look at the first one. And so how do you build consistency across an analytical project or a long-term investigative project? Furthermore, if you're managing a team of 10 people, not only how do you build consistency individually among them, but how do you build it across all of your people across time? And so one of the things by having this shared data platform and this cross-institutional analysis is everybody can have at least a common foundation or a building block of basic analytical functions and you have some consistency in that, and that can be optimized to get you the best accuracy. We've also been in situations where, you know, the vendor comes in, promises a lot of things, and then they're gone, and, and that's just uh, uh, not something that uh, you want to have happen. And then you have to balance increasing regulatory demands and increasing co uh, complexity as far as your fraud cases go. So these are some of the, the things that you need to be thinking about as you look at your uh, current and your future uh, analytical capabilities. So the key is, is how do we integrate those back-end systems into something that the front-end user wants that also gets to where you need to be, which is optimized analytical and production, uh, so you can move into the decision analytics. And so that's really the key question. So, but there's one other thing that has to occur here, and so not only do you have those two disparate uh, groups, but you also have to bring in the decision analytics perspective itself. So we talked about the back-end systems, now, just for a moment on the decision analytics. These are five common ways to do analytics. And we talked about social network analysis and entity resolution and so forth. But the way that you optimize the analytics for one may be very different as to how you optimize the analytical processes for another. Sometimes there's different software. Sometimes your people have to have different skill sets. Sometimes you need different transaction monitoring process. So what has to happen is you have to optimize these across each, uh, each other and recognize the strengths and the weaknesses. And, and then, of course, deliver some product to either a front-end user community or to some decision maker so that they can act accordingly. So to reduce these impacts, um, oftentimes we're dealing with either too much or too little data. We're often dealing with too much or too little analytics. And so it's Basically, we're looking at how you can have some initial steps to blend these data and analytical methods. Um, the first step is pretty clear, and that is you have to define the art of the possible. Where do you want to be? Why do you want to be there? And what do you hope to gain? Uh, and a lot of people forget to do that. They just chase the, the next shiny object, if you will. And so many of you have seen these types of steps before, so I'm going to click through them very quickly. And you know, you'll have these in your printout. But basically, you're creating some bad actor list, maybe bring in some experts to say, can I create a rule around something? I use some statistical analysis, pattern recognition, and so forth. But I don't want you to shy away from the bottom one, and that is to use the vetted good actors. 
Oftentimes we build bad guy profiles, but we forget to build good guy profiles. And if you want to reduce your false positives, spend time building good guy patterns and good guy profiles so that you can green light people a lot faster. And then the idea would be is that this enables you to have more of a proactive uh, trend or warning of, of fraudulent activity. So if you look at it as an evolutionary scale, most people start out in the lower left-hand corner with some simple rules they build some basic uh, anomaly detection capabilities, and then they go into, you know, incorporate social network analysis, geographic information systems, and pattern recognition. So this is just the, the evolutionary path. Ideally, though, there's a sweet spot where all of these methods combine. And this is very hard to achieve, but granted, not many people uh, can do this. But what you can do is if you identify that your anomaly detection method is very, very successful at identifying one type of fraud or one type of bad onboarding, and your social network analysis is really good at doing something else, you can blend those outcomes together so that any time that the anomaly detection score is, and I'm making up an example, between 0.7 and 0.9, you're going to look at that transaction no matter what else happens. And anytime your social network analysis is at a 0.2 or a 0.3, you're always going to look at it no matter what else happens. And the key is, is by blending these together into what some sort of ensemble mathematical method or some sort of fused analytical output then you really can drive down that false positive and really increase your, uh, your accuracy at a, a cost-effective uh, perspective. So who do you need to have at the table in order to make this happen? Well, let's look through some of these names. Uh, and we're going to, in the interest of time, go through very quickly. You need some people from the tactical operations group. You need some domain subject matter experts. If, you, if you're doing a credit card bust-out fraud, you need to have credit card people involved. You need people that understand data, not only the collection, but the storage and the processing. And you need people that can do basic and statistical type of analysis to establish a baseline. Then you turn it over to the coders and they can automate some of these processes. And then the idea is that it can deliver you strategic impacts. I've been involved with a lot of organizations where they bring the wrong people to the table or they bring the wrong focus. We're going to modernize your process. Well, if you're using an antiquated process to begin with and you're not getting good results, don't modernize that process. Shoot for where you need to be operationally, and that's the process that you bring into bear instead of modernizing something that doesn't work. So key points, and these really speak for themselves. You know, you got to do more with less. Uh, you got to do more of the same or the same with less, excuse me. You're really trying to prevent bad actors from repeating the fraud, and you're really trying to enhance business. See, we can't prevent commerce from happening. We have to enable commerce to happen. And so how do you do that while still trying to reduce the fraud as best you can? So a couple of key questions as you're looking at something like this or you're looking at how to improve your analytical capabilities. Um, really what you're looking at is not only what do you have currently, what are the current mission operations and needs, but where do you need to go in the future? You have very uh, uh, in, uh, comprehensive regulations like uh, some FATCA, some FATA 40 updates and some other things, as well as how bad guys are changing their tactics, techniques, and procedures. So if you want to make a change in 2016, because it takes you time to line up your budget and so forth, you need to already have identified who your key people in those chairs are, and you need to be start making those budget requests now. Part of those parties will be who controls the data, who controls the technology, who buys the software, who does the training. Training is a very important piece. If it's going to take you if you're going to bring a new capability or new software, you've got to train your workforce on how to use that. So some final thoughts. And again, we're, we're running uh, quickly uh, across the, a gamut of concepts here. But basically, if you can get a holistic view across an entire ecosystem, uh, we can mathematically show through, through many operational systems how this reduces cost and risk overall. And while it also does, it improves your anti-fraud and compliance capabilities. Really, the key is being able to expand the awareness. And kind of what happens is people evolve. They get into stage one, and then they kind of get a little more aware, and then they go to stage two. And it's like by the time they get to stage two or three, then they understand where they really want to go. And it's kind of a nice evolution to go through. Uh, they have to, like we talked about, maintain awareness of future, uh, keep, uh, future mission demands. But at the end of the day, sometimes this is overwhelming for some groups. And while they recognize that this is where they need to go, many small to mid-sized financial institutions just cannot do it by themselves. 
And so I'm projecting three to five years out that you're going to see more to more cloud-based hosted solutions for this kind of thing. We see it in all kinds of things. We see it in CRM. We see it in marketing. We see it in HR. So it makes sense that, uh, that we're going down this path uh, in, in this domain as well. So the question often people ask me is, how do I start? And the first thing to do is you have to conduct an internal assessment to understand what the pros and cons are, because it's not for everybody. And basically, you also have to assume, or you have to recognize that you are going to assume risk if you do it internally. And you're going to assume certain liabilities, especially as technology increases, you will be held to an ever increasingly complex, reasonable standard. So you have to make that decision. Are you willing to trade one risk for another or offshore that risk, if you will? And then the idea would be, is that you can evolve into this more collaborative, more comprehensive and robust decisioning capability through a crawl, walk, run process and implement these lessons learned from the community to lower the risk, the cost and increase success as we've, as we've highlighted today. So I recognize we've covered a lot of material. Um, you know, info at leveragedoutcomes.com. If you have any comments about anything I said today, if you think I missed the ball on something or if you think I, I need to uh, go further down in detail, uh, on something, please let me know. I love to handle these kind of challenging problems. It's a fun domain, and, and I'm excited to be part of it. So, Brendan, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Aaron. And I just I just noticed in your summary as I was going through the list of questions that were coming through, one of the, the big questions that I, I saw was this idea of, you know, how do you start? And I think you really touched on that at the beginning, is that you you have to, I guess, weigh the risks of going it alone versus thinking of this collaborative approach. And if I was to add just something small to that, I think one of the other things that a lot of institutions that we've worked with have seen is, is you, you really have to define the scope of the problem because, you know, different solutions are applicable to different problems. And I think you touched on it a little bit there as well that, you know, if you have a specific problem from a money laundering perspective, that may lead itself more to one particular approach than if you have a problem in a specific area of fraud. So, you know, in terms of where do I go and how do I start and how do I look at this idea of, of you know, analytics and cross-institutional analytics and so on. I think it's defining the scope of the problem and then I love that evaluate, crawl, walk, run approach because that's how you, you really take that approach. So I'm, I'm glad you were able to touch on that at the end. Thanks for that. Um, Thank you. Just build a little bit more on, in terms of what we started off at the top. Um, as I mentioned, uh, before I hand it back to Todd to wrap up, part two of our presentation series is going to be uh, later in October. And uh, I can't guarantee we'll move away from the chess pieces and into a Halloween theme, but uh, certainly look for invitations out from uh, ACAMS uh, in the October time frame for that. In preparation for that, I want to try something a little bit different than what we've done with ACAMS in the past. I'd, I'd love to hear the thoughts of the audience in terms of today's presentation and their thoughts on cross-institutional detection. And we've set up a special email address here at Verifin, for Amalex at Verifin.com, and myself and my colleagues are going to be monitoring that over the next couple of weeks. And certainly if you have thoughts on today's presentation and where you'd like to see us go in the second presentation in terms of how do we really fight financial crime using game-changing techniques, email us at Framalex at Verifin.com, and we'll try to incorporate that as best as we can, um, take that input in, and really use that as part of the uh, presentation um, the next time around. Todd, I feel like we're back up to the top of the hour, and, and the big question that I saw come through, I think JR did a, a good job of touching on there at the end, so I'm not sure we have time for any additional questions, um, but I'll, I'll turn it back over to you so we can wrap up today. Thank you. No, we don't have time, but those questions are valuable to us, as we always say, uh, for two reasons. One is it sounds like you've got this framelexitverifin.com email address for people to send things directly relevant to the event in October. And then I'm going to flip away from that, so hurry and write that down, framelx at verifin.com. I'm going to put our usual one up here. We got lots of questions from the audience. As we always say, those are valuable to us uh, during the webinar and after the webinar for articles, uh, future events, all those kind of things. Please keep those questions coming. If they are for JR or Brendan, you can send them to training at acams.org and include your suggestions for future web seminars. So again, training at acams.org. Brendan, JR, thank you very much. And everyone else, we hope you have a fantastic rest of day.